Hello everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to the Diverse Books for Teens webinar. My name's Beth Yates. I'm the children's consultant here at the Indiana State Library. I'm in our professional development office and I'm going to be your host and question moderator today. Um, our presenter for today is Edith Campbell. She's the education librarian at Indiana State University. But before we jump into the content of this webinar, I'd like to start off with just a couple of announcements. First of all, to register for other webinars available from the Professional Development Office and our partners, please visit the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. For a full list of our current in-person training topics, please see the Continuing Education page of our website. Today's webinar will be archived and available to access and share on the Indiana State Library's archived training page. Please allow a few weeks for it to appear on that site. The Indiana State Library has many ways we try to stay connected to library staff across the state. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Collection, features interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and is a good source for information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. Okay, so now on to technical issues. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the sound issues box just below the chat box on the left side of the screen. It's the lower left side of the screen. If there is a global sound issue, meaning others are experiencing the issue also, we will announce it in the chat box. If you're unable to resolve the sound issues you're experiencing, please be reassured that we are recording the meeting and you can watch it offline later after the meeting has ended. Again, if there is a global sound issue, we will make an announcement in the chat box. At this time, we are not experiencing any global sound issues. If you have a question for our presenter during this webinar, just type it in the chat box in the upper left hand side, upper left hand side of your screen, and I will be watching that and I'll get your question to Edie as soon as there is a good opportunity. There should also be time near the end for questions. Okay, one more thing, on to LEUs. I'm sure you're all wanting to know about that. This session is one hour, so you will get one LEU for today. We have a new procedure for webinar LEUs. To get your LEU certificate today, you will need to remain on the webinar until the very end, and there will be an opportunity for you to download a PDF that you can then print out and write your name on. Again, you should remain on the webinar until the very end, and you will receive your LEU then. I will not be sending out certificates via email as we've done in the past. Okay, so now without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Edie. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you for, for joining us today. Um, I do have to tell you that I am in Indianapolis doing this webinar for you, and the notes from my presentation are at home in Terre Haute. <laughs> And I, I, luckily I did go over it this morning, so hopefully, and I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, just a little more nervous than I would be because the notes aren't with me. Sure, you'll do great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so to get started, um, I have created a Google Doc um, that I have posted um, the names of authors, um, blogs and other resources on there. And since it's a Google Doc, um, you're more than welcome to add to that document so that um, it can serve as a resource for those who are, are here or even those who you, you can share it, of course. Um, so feel free to go there to find more information or to find the same information located there for you or to add to it. Um, the hashtag Indivya is Twitter. Um, if you tweet titles, if you tweet any information, I can put that together also in a StoreFi and put a link to the StoreFi in the Google Doc so that any information shared on Twitter can be made available to you also. Um, 
And I really hope that you do take the time and effort to share, particularly current 2017 young adult books, because I cannot talk about 2017 books. I am trying not to mention any authors who have that I know of who have um, books coming out this year. Um, there may be some that are coming I'm not aware of, but I can't talk about them, but you can. So please be sure and share anything from this year that you would like. Um, Edie, we have one person who says the link isn't working for them. Um, is there any secret to getting to it? If, if not, you want to send it to me later. Yeah, I and can do that. Maybe I can send yeah. that out to everybody. Yeah. Okay, Erin. Did you try um, HTTP in front of it? That might make a difference. Yeah. I'm not sure. But you could try that. Um, and if not, um, I can repair it when I go home and then send that to Beth later. And I'm sorry, that's not working. We'll um, give that a try. So I started blogging 10 years ago. Um, I became a librarian just shortly before that. Um, I was in Indianapolis Public Schools. And I had heard so many teachers, so many parents, um, students, even my own daughter complaining that they couldn't find books with characters who looked like them. And I wanted to, to learn a new technology. I wanted to do something different and to kind of extend my skills. In the library, we need to know technology. So um, I decided to start a blog and I decided that I would blog about, um, at the time I was just blogging about African Americans in, in children and teens literature. I think I always did young adult. Um, and that kind of expanded um, over the years um, to include um, um, authors of color as well as Native Americans. And um, it, it grew into, once I realized that um, it, it wasn't just enough to be able to locate the books, but there's a real problem with representation in in children's books, with how people of color, without how LGBTQ people, how people with disabilities, how Native Americans are represented in books, I, I realized there was a, a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And that became more of my focus, trying to improve the representation. And, and even if you look at some of my early reviews, I'd say within the past four or five years, you'll notice a real shift in how I've been reviewing books on the blog, that I, I do more of a critical analysis rather than just the, the typical literary type of review, looking at character and plot and theme, but also looking for microaggressions, looking for representation for issues of social justice, um, so that we can try and improve what's available for uh, improve what's available for young people. Um, so, at first, if we look at um, the demographics here in the state of Indiana, um, you'll notice that we are a predominantly white state. And um, when I moved to Terre Haute, um, I moved from Indianapolis, I moved to Terre Haute about five years ago. And when I moved, I was told that Terre Haute was a very white city, that it was black and white, predominantly white, and there was nothing else. And that couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, I'd say probably since the 40s, maybe later than that, Terre Haute has had a large Syrian population. Um, there is a Jewish population. There's a Jewish synagogue in Terre Haute. Right across from the synagogue, right across the street from the synagogue, there is a mosque. Oh, really? Yeah. There are, um, there's a, a Chinese population that's been there for quite a while. They have rest, mainly you see them through restaurants, but there's a Chinese school. There's a Japanese American population there. There's a Toyota plant not too far from Terre Haute. So there's a Japanese population as well. Um, but we're told that they're not there, that invisibility is, is one of the issues that, that um, is a problem with children's literature, even with how demographics are kept. If you're in schools, I think you know that when you're doing the check boxes for, for ethnicity, you're white or you're black, and there's nothing else counts, and it's just, it's crazy the way we do that. But if you look at this, you can see that um, Throughout the state, there really are there's very little representation in, in in Indiana, and when I looked at these numbers, what it brought to mind to me was this: it is amazing how close representation in children's books matches representation or demographics throughout the state of Indiana. 
um, not exactly the same, but very, very close. And so what this says is that the type, the, the thoughts of whiteness, of white privilege that exist in Indiana are going to be similar to what you're going to find in children's books. So you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. The privileges that people have who publish books are going to be similar to the privileges we're going to find with politicians, with business leaders throughout the state of Indiana. Um, think about your communities and how few how few people of color you see, and that's what it's going to be like in children's books. Of course, the exceptions are going to be the larger cities, Gary, um, Indiana, Indianapolis, and Fort Wayne are going to be a little bit different. But for most of the communities, um, your, your cities look like children's books. But what I would like to ask you in, in thinking about your community, so we get an idea of what you know, the state really looks like, um, tell us the community you're from in the chat box, and what does the diversity look like there in your libraries? Do you see one or two children of color, one or two African Americans, a few Latinos? Is there a large, significant population? I know there's a city near Terre Haute that has a huge Italian population. Clinton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what's it like where you are? What what are what are the um, diversities like there? Um, if it's all white and that's it, tell us. Um, it, it's interesting to know what, what we're going to see throughout the state. We have multiple attendees typing. So what, what are some of them saying? It's not popping up quite yet. Okay. I think it's interesting that there are more books with animals and trucks yes. than there are of people of, of color. And, and what's really interesting with those animals and trucks Many of those animals are used to represent people of color. Oh. And it, she, she, this is um, Leslie Ball is an um, academic in Minnesota, no, Wisconsin, and she's currently researching the representation that is done with animals and trucks. Interesting. And books. Panda bears are Asian Americans. Um, uh -huh. I think rabbits and... I forget our Latinos, and I don't know what they typically use for African Americans. I'm not sure. Huh. It is it is fascinating the way that's done. Yeah, yeah. We do have a few responses. Um, let's see. Oh gosh, we have several. Um, we have uh, one who says they have some Mexican immigrants. Another one says almost all white. A few blacks, a few Hispanic. Um, there's someone from downtown Indianapolis, and it seems mixed to her, but she lives in Carthage, Indiana, and it seems to be mostly white. Mm -hmm. Um, Beth Lang says in Liberty, Indiana, it's mostly white, a few black and Hispanic. Uh, Tracy, primarily white in Crawford County. Amber is in Vevey, Indiana, and says mostly white, a few black, quite a few Latinos. Teresa says Kokomo, Howard County Public Library, downtown branch, it's mixed, but mostly mm -hmm. white. And Judy says, I'm on the near south side of Indianapolis. We have a very mixed community with African Americans, whites, and Latinos. Mm -hmm. Um, Aaron says, Indianapolis, lots of Nigerians and other Africans, Hispanics and Asian Indians, mm -hmm. Pacific Islanders, and white. Um, Christina says, she went to ISU, so she can totally relate to what you're saying about Terre Haute. I used to live next to the Jewish temple, and she currently works in Indianapolis, so it's a huge mixture. Okay. And we do have somebody else still typing, but... Okay, so... That's interesting, and and to have that awareness, I think, is important to, to know what our communities look like and to know um, how to know how to serve them. We need to know what they look what they look like. Um, to have conversations around race, it, it's important. I know it's difficult. I know that some of the things I say here may make some of you feel uncomfortable, um, but that's okay because uncomfortable you're, you're not going to grow unless you're uncomfortable in some things. Um, I I do not claim to be an expert on all things race and diversity. Um, I would say when I started my blog, I could not have had this conversation. I didn't have the awareness. Um, it, it's a growing thing. You know, our, our awareness of the world um, continues to grow. And I think as, as librarians, um, we're people who like to learn. We like information, not just organizing it, but interacting with it. Mm -hmm. And and I think we want to learn about the world around us. And, and for the sake of our patrons, that's something that we really have to keep doing. Um, sometimes I wish I had found another occupation where I didn't have to keep learning and changing, but <laughs> I don't think I'd be happy in any other any yeah. other occupation. I, I think that deep down I really do enjoy it. It would get boring. 
<laughs> so in, in that uh, serving our patrons, um, we have to think about the, the ALA code of ethics that ask us to think more than our personal convictions so that we're truly um, representing and working with people in our communities and serving them to the best of our ability in the um, information we provide and the access to that information. So you might keep that in mind um, as you are trying to bring change about in your libraries and how the profession does ask you to change and grow and work for the, the good of your community. Um, I think one thing that I really learned because I was a school librarian, and I think public librarians learn this too, is how to advocate for our users, mm -hmm. um, how to make sure that we are acting in their best half. Um, as a librarian, that's making sure that um, people who have mobility issues are able to navigate the space. That means being sure that um, the signage we use is in, has inclusive images. It means that our language is not biased when we're speaking with people or um, even in the signage that we use that we're careful with what we say and how we say it. And, and not just careful in how we say it, but that our intentions are, are genuine as well. So um, those are just some things that we might need to consider in our libraries at large um, as a whole. So there are a few rules I'm going to give you in um, thinking about um, diverse books. And of course, their rules, general guidelines, they're not absolutes. There's always exceptions in how we do things. So the first one of those is going to be um, with the books, with, with any book, of course, before you use it or, or um, um, interact with it, you want to read it, but make sure you make that extra effort to start reading more diverse, more widely. Read beyond your comfort range. It's only, you know, your users are going to ask you about books that you don't typically read, so make sure you're reading those so that you can serve your populations well. Um, when I'm talking about your populations using um, diverse books, what we're calling diverse books, um, I'm not just talking about the one or two um, African Americans or the few Latinos, um, the white children need to read the diverse books as well. Um, I mentioned that I, uh, I, I started doing this thinking about my daughter and students who just couldn't find the books, but in any day now, I have a granddaughter coming. Oh. It's gonna be my first granddaughter. I am so excited. I want her to be able to read books that have beautiful representations of people. I want books that show her people like her navigating the world around them, who are creative and who are empowered. Um, so let's, and, and so when she comes to visit me here in Indianapolis, I don't want her to worry about some trooper who grew up in some little town in Indiana who's gonna pull her over on the road, who has never encountered an African-American before. And she'll actually be a biracial African-American girl. And she's going to be a knockout. I'm sure she is. Mm -hmm. But I don't want her to have to worry about how she's going to be treated by some state trooper who has never seen a person of color before. Um, our students throughout the state, our young people throughout the state, are going to meet people of color in books. And um, so let's give them good quality books that are going to give them um, good ways to critically think and interact with the world. Have your policies in place. Think about your collection development policies, thinking about your challenge policies. Have them in place before you do it. If you don't have them yet, before you add any more books to your collection, create those policies. That's going to protect you and your library. It's going to protect your collections. Don't create those policies in isolation. Work with your communities. Work with your principal. Create something that he or she can support and work with you on so that if there is a challenge and you have the sheet or form that needs to be completed by the challenger, make sure that you have the support of your principal and the first thing she says isn't pull the book. Make sure the first thing she says is, okay, what's the policy say? What do we do next? Mm -hmm. So be sure and, and, and protect yourself in that way. Um, don't single students out. Um, I grew up in an all predominantly white Catholic school in Toledo. In my class, there were roughly 100 in my class, and there were two black children, me and a boy. Um, and I can remember in the fourth grade when we talked about Africa for the first time, everyone turned and looked at me because we were talking about Africa. Um, students are singled out enough when they're different. 
Um, we don't want to add to that. Do not expect that one black child to want to read black books. Do not expect them to be the expert on what a good black book is. We don't talk enough about race with young people. Um, that young person may not have the awareness that you do. And um, you're going to make them very uncomfortable. I can think of a situation I was in with a, with a student um, when I was at the high school. And they were reading, the student was reading um, a LGBT book. And I thought he may want another one. And I offered it to him. He was very offended that I offered him the book. And I said, and, and I, I apologize. Those numbers are wrong. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> oh. I don't. Um, I can't remember everything I said to him, but I do remember apologizing. I do remember telling him that um, he was such a nice-looking young man because he was really a cute kid. Mm -hmm. That he was so cute that I wanted him to have a good book that he would join. This really was a good book, and if he was offended, I apologize. And he, it seemed to be a good exchange. So if you do make that mistake, own it, apologize. Um, these students are, are um, they need our support. They, they don't need to feel singled out. Now, there, there are, uh, there's always that exception. There are those students who are there on their own, and they're outspoken for themselves, and that's great. But I would imagine that most of them do not want to be singled out. Um, when, you, when you do the book talks and you include books with Latinos, and you have that one Latino student, pay attention to how classmates react. Do they turn and look at that student? Do they seem to support them? And that's going to give you a, a, a real indication of what you can do to support that single student and to make things better for them in your library. Um, build inclusively. Um, when you're thinking about lesson plans that you are working with um, teachers on, if you're thinking about um, if you're thinking about um, building displays or doing book talks or book clubs or probably apply. yeah don't don't just do um, a display of African American books or a display of um, Asian American books do a display of sports and include Sammy Lee and Hank Aaron and a, a diverse group of individuals in that display um, don't Students aren't going to be attracted to um, a single ethnic display, or if you have an LGBT display, I don't think that's going to attract many students to it. And build those in. Um, to me, diversity is not about exclusion, but it's about inclusion. So in include um, diverse authors in other collections um, so that the representation is there and there's a sense of equity and social justice in, in what you're promoting. Um, challenge. Challenge yourself and challenge your students and challenge your, your staff or your faculty, your colleagues, your co-workers to read beyond themselves, to read more diversely. Um, there's a challenge that the, that Gene Wen Yang has. Um, he is the National Children's, the National I think National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, and he has a challenge going on right now. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes. I don't know the exact name of it, but his challenge is to read beyond what you typically read. If all you read are is prose, then you need to think about reading poetry. If you only read white female authors, then challenge yourself to read something completely different. If all your books have straight characters, think about reading LGBT characters. Um, if you only read um, the prose, think about graphic novels. If you only read fiction, think about nonfiction. And you could um, have and some intersectionality in that. Um, you could read African American graphic novels. You could read a biography of a Latino. Um, so challenge yourself and your students, the people around you, to really think about reading something differently from what they typically read. Um, so the books I'm going to talk about, um, when I'm talking about books, I talk about diversity. Um, typically, the diversity I address is people of color, Native Americans. But I'm sure you know there is much wider diversity than that. There is religious diversity, there is um, gender identity, there's sexual orientation, there is 
um, abilities, disabilities that all make us different. Um, I tend to promote own voices, um, books of people writing within their own experience. Um, remember earlier when we looked at the state of Indiana and we looked at the books, um, we looked at those numbers and, we, and I talked about the whiteness that dominates those books, the privilege that's in those books. Um, we're not giving authentic voice to people of color when someone else is telling their story. Um, there are some authors who get it right. There are way too many who don't. There are way too many authors of color who aren't getting, don't even have the opportunity to get published. They might publish one book and are never published again. There are numerous who have given up on traditional publishing and are doing self-published books. And I don't have any of those books listed here for you, but the quality of self-published books is really increasing and it's really improving. So you might um, start considering some of those. Um, Do you have a list of some of those books on your blog? Um, I don't have very many. I had a okay. bad experience several years ago with a self-published author, but ah. I've, I've recently been interacting with more of the self-published authors and realizing that um, they really have improved the quality of what they're doing. Mm. Um, yeah, so there'll be more of those coming through, and there's some tiny little publishing houses that are really pushing limits much more than our traditional um, publishers are. Those are listed on the blog. The, okay. the small publishers are listed there. Um, so this this book by Rainy Patel, uh, Rainy Patel in Full Effect by Sonia Patel, um, that's there because even though I promote own voices, um, books written by authors of color, they're not perfect. Um, there are microaggressions, there are um, acts and, and things in the books that are questionable, and this is this is a, one of the books that had something questionable in it. Um, it is a very good book. It's a about a young Indian American girl growing up in Hawaii, and she has issues with her father. Um, she is into hip hop and really relates to young people. Um, but the problem is some comments that she makes about Native American culture that just aren't accurate. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and with that being there, there's a place in the book where she mentions something about Hawaiian culture. She says, um, I really don't know the culture well, but blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And so it made me question the rest of what she says about Hawaiian culture. How authentic, how accurate are her other comments about um, Hawaiian culture? Um, she, uh, I can't say that. Yeah, she, um, <laughs> um, I still, I would recommend it for older readers. Um, I don't know if they would catch the microaggressions in the book, but I, I do know that it is an otherwise good book. And maybe that's a conversation that you could have. Exactly. With. Yeah. Yeah. So in looking for books, there are a few places I'm going to recommend you look. And of course, these are only three people. There are numerous other people. Um, I listed these people because they're more likely to recommend books than some of the other people I might mention to you. Angie Manfredi is a public librarian in New Mexico, and have you met or heard of Angie? Mm -mm. She is awesome. She's on the really? Newberry Committee this year, oh. and she um, she's in a community, a small community in New Mexico, um, Latino and white. There are no African Americans in this community, probably very few Asians, if any. But she has a huge celebration every February. She has a huge African-American literature event. And she's, had, she's posted pictures of it. And her readers just love it. This woman knows books. She, she is phenomenal. I just, if you only followed Angie, you, you'd be great. You'd be good to go because mm -hmm. Angie is wonderful. Mike Jung is an author, um, Something Something Suburban Objects. You might be familiar with his writing. Uh, he's more of a middle grade author, um, but it, he is great to follow. He has a, a he and Angie, all these authors have wonderful social awareness. Um, Mike kind of takes you on the journey with him. Uh, his awareness is just um, the the last book that he wrote about suburban objects. Um, had to do with a, um, a young person who is um, growing in their awareness of their own culture. And that's very much like Mike's own experience. And he kind of takes you on that journey with him. He's in library school right now. He wants to be a librarian. And um, he 
promotes other authors and books. He is just wonderful to follow. Um, Karuna, um, Color K, um, she just had the gauntlet come out with um, oh, Salam Reads, the middle school book. And to learn um, about what's going on with Muslim books, with um, Asian books, um, really, she's wonderful. And and she shares a lot of her own experience, a lot of hate directed in her in the community where she lives at. Mm -hmm. And she she's really a good one to follow, to realize what it's like to be other in, in this country. So those are three very different people who are just going to give you a really good um, exposure to own voices in um, in uh, in children's and young adult literature. Karuna is Muslim American. Mike is, I want to say Korean American. And Angie is white American. And they are all really phenomenal people. Other places you can look for books are on these blogs that, and this is, you can find all these on my blog. You can find all these when we get that Google Doc up and running. So you don't have to worry about quickly trying to write all these down. We'll make sure you get access to this information. And we could also share the PowerPoint with them? Yeah, sure. OK, so we can share the PowerPoint with you as well. Um, the first one is is mine. Um, the second one, Book Toss, is Laura Jimenez. She is actually an education professor, but she does wonderful critical analysis of books. She, Debbie, and I are about the only people who are really doing those critical reviews of books. And those they're just so important to have right now. Disability and Kid Lit, Gay YA, Kitab World is going to be, um, I think, more Muslim. I believe it's children's and young adult. Latinos and Kid Lit is going to be, it's not just own voices, it's anyone who writes books with uh, Latinx characters. They're going to do children and young adults. Mirrors, Windows, and Doors is um, a fantastic resource for children and children's and young adults. Um, reading as I am, as Asian, Reading While White is um, a group of librarians, I think they're all librarians, mm -hmm. who um, look at whiteness in children's and young adult literature. Um, yeah, they're a really popular blog right now. I think they do some book reviews. I, I don't think that's predominantly what they do, but they do do book reviews. Multiculturalism rocks. Natalie is a Cameroonian American, and she discusses issues. I don't think she does many book reviews. Um, she's a sporadic blogger, but she gives you a lot to think about. Um, Dev characters in adolescent literature is one I just became aware of when I was putting this together. I asked people on Facebook um, for some own voices blogs, and they gave me that name. So I'm really looking forward to visiting that blog and finding out what's going on there. Um, De Colores is Latino children's literature. Um, and it is a really, they're going to do critical stuff there too. Yeah, that's a really radical one. I, I enjoy that blog. Um, We're the People's Summer Reading List is actually a book list that I put together with um, authors and librarians. And Ed is actually a he used to be a first grade teacher. Um, we've been doing this book list for three years. We critically read every book we put on the list. We do picture books, chapter books, um, early readers, uh, middle grade, um, YA. We used to do adult crossover, but we couldn't do it this year. We just didn't have time. And I think two or three of us are on book selection committees, so we didn't have time mm -hmm. to do the reading for this. Um, but we did come up with a, a really good list for you. Um, every book on that list has been read at least twice, um, critically read, not just read, but critically read so that there are no microaggressions, no misrepresentations in the book. And um, it came out a couple of weeks ago. If you go to the site and um, you can download a um, PDF and, and print a copy of the list as well. So I think that um, those blogs are going to be good sources for you to find books. And I'm going to recommend those for you. 
somewhat over the traditional reviewers. Some of the traditions are going to lead you to some of these blogs. Um, are you familiar with the um, When We Was Fierce issue a couple of, about a year ago or so? I'm not. Okay. Um, when We Was Fierce um, is a book that received several star reviews. There were a few other reviewers who kind of felt there were a few problems with it, but they still gave it starred reviews. And they completely missed the horrible issues with this book. It was mm -hmm. written by E.E. E. Trujillo. It's not her full name. She um, created an African dialect, a vernacular. Oh. Yeah, and it was horrible and her representation of the african-american community she was writing a book about um violence in the community and someone was there, there was yeah she was writing a reaction to the police shootings but from in her writing she placed the blame for the violence in the community she saw the community as being violent and there were just so many and her mm -hmm. portrayal of black women was problematic as well and none of the reviewers caught any of these issues. Um, but there was such a brouhaha about the book that it has been with, withdrawn. Um, this, this happened just before the book was to be released. So the public, it was Candlewick, and they did not release the book. Mm. None of the major reviewers caught it. They're not doing the critical reads of the books. They're still doing the literary analysis. And we, if we're going to be doing um, more diverse books, if we're looking at for social justice, we've got to look at more issues mm -hmm. in these books. So what I thought I would do to get you looking at books, um, to tell you about some of the books, is to look at what's on my bookshelf at home. Um, so this is my very top bookshelf. And that book, um, and as I'm doing this, if you think of some other books that you want to talk about, um, go ahead and um, chime in. Give us some other books. Feel free to do that. Did, we don't have any questions. Or? We don't. I missed some comments earlier. Okay. Um, Marie said, let's see. Oh, Melissa said that she's in South Bend and they see at their main library, black, Hispanic, white, and, and immigrants from Malawi. I probably, did I say that right? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay. And Marie says she has... The teens help with her displays. All oh, teens, that's great. which is a great, that's great. Idea. Yeah. Um, and Robbie said she was commenting on the book from earlier that she really liked that book and she didn't catch those uh, the microaggressions. Yeah. That you yeah. Go back and read it, and you'll she be says, horrified Thank you. with what you read in that mm. book. It's awful. Um. Any more? Mm. Nope. That's it for now. Okay. So if we look at the top shelf of the bookshelf, um, I'm just going to mention a few of these. That first one there that I highlighted, Black Top, came out a couple years ago, and it's actually a series. Um, Justin is a basketball player. I believe it's written for low ability, low interest readers, and um, moves quickly. So it's really a pretty good book. I, I enjoy. I was. I'm tired of black boys and basketball, and that was my only problem with the book. It really is a good book, and unfortunately, as we go through this, you're going to see very few male authors and very few books that seem as though they're written for males, um, but this one is. It's a series. Um, I, I would strongly recommend that. The Secret Sky um, is a story set in Afghanistan. The author was a, or is a CNN correspondent, so she's you know very... Savvy in the international front. Um, this is a young, and she's, um, I think she's originally from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. She, um, the main character is a young girl. It's a love story. And it, it starts out as seeming like a really young, gentle story, but it's not. It's really an intense story. It's, it's really pretty good. Um, the Wrath and the Dawn mm -hmm. um, is the beginning of a series. Um, it's set in that timeless era of the past. Um, it's um, Southeast Asia, um, Southwest Asia. It's in Southwest Asia, I think. It's got that feel to it. It's got that culture to it. Um, very, very well written. Um, um, I think it's a young girl, and she's trying to save her brother. Um, Sophie Mendoza is really an older book, but it's a wonderful book. It's a young girl who 
doesn't know that she's undocumented and she goes to Mexico and she can't get back in the United States. And she's stuck there living with her relatives and it's a very eye-opening experience for her. Um, of course, you see Kwame Alexander's book. I'm sure you all have Kwame in your library. If you don't, please get him. Um, you should also have Jason Reynolds in your book, in your libraries. Um, they're just really prolific writers. Um, they, uh, I think that Kwame um, kind of mentored Jason, mm -hmm. and I think Jason was also mentored by Walter Dean Myers. So they have a very, very strong writing ethic, eth ethic, <laughs> very <laughs> strong writing ethic, and just writing really phenomenal stuff right now. I've heard a lot about All American Boys, but it's really wonderful. It, it is very good, and I'm going to talk more about his oh. co-author, okay. Brendan Kiley, but that is an excellent book. It, um, the, the perspectives of both characters in there, it's, it's really well written. Yeah. We do have one comment. Erin says she just finished reading The Pants Project. It's a middle grade book, but great for kids who are trying to learn more about being transgender. Ah, okay. Have okay. No, I have not. Do we know if the author is transgendered on mm -hmm. that one? Erin, do you know if the author is transgender? She also says Beyond Magenta is supposed to be great for teens on yeah. that subject. Also. Yeah, that one's good too. She's not yeah. sure about the author. Okay, because it makes a difference if someone is writing about a transgendered person rather than someone themselves telling that story. So there's a reason this is blank. Okay, there are, <laughs> there are some books I do not have in my library, and one of them is Ghosts. This one was challenged. Um, I mentioned Book Toss, and I mentioned Debbie Reese's American Indians and Children's Literature. Both of their blogs have wonderful reviews, very critical reviews of this book, how it appropriates Latin American culture in its representation of Cinco de, is it Cinco de Mayo? No, it's not Cinco de Mayo. It's um, Dia de los Muertes. Dia de los Muertes, yes. And there are issues with um, how it misrepresents Native American history. Mm -hmm. um, and this book is still getting recognition and awards, and it's just very highly problematic. Um, instead, um, if you want a book of someone who is writing outside their culture who does a great job, we just mentioned Brendan Kiley who wrote All American Boys with Jason. This is a beautiful book. It's a wonderful book about, um, it, it's really a hero's journey. Um, it's um, a young boy going across country with his grandfather who has Alzheimer's. And on the way, he really checks his privilege. He really becomes aware of people and their issues. It's a very good story. Um, I would strongly recommend that one. Um, I would recommend anything by Lori Halls Anderson, and um, this is a trilogy, and there really mm -hmm. are three books with three different covers in this trilogy, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's interesting to read that and, and see her development as an author as she's writing it, to see how her awareness changed from the first book through the last book. Um, she's just really a phenomenal writer. Um, J.L. Powers wrote this a few years ago, this thing called The Future is a book set in South Africa. She has a wonderful job representing that culture. She's, she's studied it as an academic. She's lived there. Um, she has people that she considers family members from there, um, her brothers and her sisters. She's been, you know, essentially adopted. It's just really a good, authentic book to get an idea of, of some issues in South Africa. And of course, mm. Ash Ashley Hope Perez writes about Latino communities. Um, she started out as an E and L teacher in Texas, and she's she's just brilliant. And she's a, you read a lot of books about um, the Latino culture written by E and L teachers who they've taught students, so now they know their culture. And no, they don't. They don't mm. know the culture, but Ashley does, and she's done a phenomenal job with this book. And what's really outstanding about this book is that it's historical fiction. And historical fiction is really hard to write with the um, terminology you have to use, with the microaggressions that you really have to present to be authentic. But she does it in a way that makes it makes it work. She's really, really good with that. We have another comment. Um, April says she just did a book club with a Latino group at our local high school. They read The House on Mango Street. Certainly not a new book, but the kids found it very relatable all the same 
subject matter is more appropriate for high school, not so much for middle yeah. school or twins. Yeah, I, I believe that was originally adult, I think, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely for older older readers. Um, a few African American titles. Um, Tanita Davis's Peas and Carrots is about a black family that takes in a white foster girl. Um, it has nothing to do with race, nothing at all. It has more to do with privilege and um, the young, the young black girl. They're about the same age, and their parents say, "Oh, this will be great. You know, they'll be friends." And that's probably the worst thing the parents could have done. But the, the girl learns how to open her heart and her home to this young girl, and it's it's just a really, it's a kind, gentle book. We just don't get kindness and gentleness that gentleness that much in young adult literature. And and this one, this one has it. She has a good relationship with her mom. Um, just really a nice book. Two Naomi's by. Um, Bemi, and I'm sorry, I can't read the name of the other author on that. This came out late last year about two girls, both named Naomi, um, one white, one black, and their parents began dating. Um, excellent story. She's an excellent writer. Um, Kimberly Reed's Perfect Liar really, really astonished me. Um, I, I want to give you the details on that one, but I don't want to ruin the story. <laughs> um this one, um, there are liars and there are thieves and there are con men and there are police officers in this mix. And it's it's um, this young girl and her brother and her family who have one set of values and the young girl, and her, they grew up with one values and one of them kind of veers in another direction and it's, it's interesting. It's, it's very contemporary. It's a Lee and Law book. It's the first book in a series. It when you start reading it, it reads like some of the old urban fiction where you know it just mentions all the um, brand names and labels, and you think, oh, it's one of these books. And it's not mm-hmm. one of those books. It's oh. really a good book. I really enjoyed reading that one. Um, Stacy Lee's Under Painted Sky is. Um, Historical fiction is a young Chinese girl out in the West. She has to run away for some reason. And when she runs, oh, she, I know why she runs away. She has to run away and she takes an enslaved African American girl with her. And they um, meet up with some cowboys. And so they decide to pretend to be boys. And um, comedy, romance, nice book. She's a really good author. Um, Guadalupe McCall. Guadalupe Garcia McCall, Shame the Stars. This one I have not read. I read her Under the Mesquite Tree and something about Mariposa, something about Butterflies. She has another book she wrote um, that's also a hero's journey. And I'm sorry the title's not coming, but she's a really good author. She's with Lee and Lowe. Um, Marie Lu, her champion, is part of her Legend series. Um, and it's also gone graphic. Um, so there are graphic novels on that one. Um, Kekla Magoon, How It Went Down. Um, let's see, The Rock and the River, she wrote X. Kekla is an Indiana author. She lives in Fort Wayne. She lives right down the street from Helen Frost, another wonderful Indiana author. Um, you should have Helen and Kekla's books in your library because they both are award-winning authors and they are Indiana authors as well. Mm-hmm. Um is that other one, Summer of the Mariposa? Summer of the Mariposa. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so another, um, we just talked about, she, she was, they both lived on the same street. Um, Sonia Manzano lived on Sesame Street. Oh. Um, this is her Becoming oh, yeah. Maria. And she had another, fix, she had a fiction book that came out a few years before this one. This is her um, autobiography. Um, it's mainly her teen years, but it, Goes a little. I thought it went a little long at the end because it takes you all the way up to when she started at Sesame Street. But it's um, really it's it's a really good book. And we don't see many um, biographies of women. We don't see many uh, Puerto Ricans. And this is that. So it's it's a really good book that you might want to consider having in your library. I'm looking at some um, more international type books. International is not the same thing as diversity. Those are would be called global. Um, so these are some global books. Um, Adi Al Said um, is Palestinian. He grew up, I believe, in Mexico City. Um, this is his second book. 
um, really good global perspectives in his writing, beautiful global perspectives in Marcus, Sam Marcus Samuelson's Make It Messy. Um, Samuelson actually is a Somali who was adopted at a young age by a family in Sweden, and he grew up in Sweden. Um, he learned to cook there from his Swedish grandmother. He went to Paris to perfect his craft, and of course, he ended up in New York. And um, it's it's a really good story. It's an honest story because he reveals some of his character flaws, some things that happened to him when he was younger. And um, it's just it's a really good book that really I don't think got enough attention when it came out a few years ago. Um, another nonfiction that's important to have in your libraries is Dreaming and Indian. I actually read a book recently that said that all Native Americans are dead. No, they are not dead. There are still Native Americans alive and kicking in this country, in this state, in this city, probably in your libraries. Um, this is a beautiful book, um, high gloss images. Um, it's voices of contemporary Native Americans. It's artwork that they create. Um, work and projects that they're doing. Just a phenomenal book by Lisa Charlie Boy, and she does have a second book out. Um, I would really recommend her books for your libraries. Very contemporary nonfiction. Sung Ju Lee, um, Every Falling Star, is someone who escaped from North Korea and um, came to the U.S. and told his story. Um, my American, my underground American dream, an undocumented um, Latinx immigrant who made it to Wall Street, and it'd be really interesting to follow up on her and find out since she's out of herself, um, you know, what's going on with her under the new administration. Mm -hmm. So in reading that, there could be a really good follow-up on both of these books to find out what's happening with these authors. So these are um, good contemporary books that you might want to consider for your libraries as well. The Culling is on the We the People summer reading list. Uh, Stephen Dos Santos is a gay Latinx author. The Culling is dystopian. Um, it is a young man who has been selected for the Culling, and um, there, there's jealousy and um, love problems, love a little love triangle going on. And, and it's really interesting because we don't typically get that kind of thing in LGBT fiction. We don't have um, the depth of relationships that, that this book is going to give you. Um, it's it's an intense read when it comes to um, the the storyline and the uh, future that he set up. Um, Randy Pink's book came out a few uh, maybe last year. Um, I interviewed her at Allen this past year, and I had a few problems with it. There are a lot of stereotypes in this book, and mm -hmm. to me, stereotypes are a laziness. They're, they're missing that character development you could do, and I can kind of understand why she did it, but. Um, I put it here for you, um, thinking about that one or two um, child, one or two children of color who may be in your school or in your library. This is a young black girl who wishes, she, who prays herself white. She's tired of, think of all the stereotypes you've heard about black people. and She's tired of all those stereotypes of being that person. So she prays herself white. She wakes up one day and she's white. When her family sees her, they see the black version of her. But when she goes to school, she's this new white girl at school. And um, it's it's a good book to have for that single black student. And it's a really good book for for the white children who befriend this you know, the, the single black student to have an idea of what that black girl is going through, mm -hmm. um, how you might support her. Um, Randy said that she gets tons and tons of emails and letters from, from girls who have read her book and really appreciate her sharing that story with them. Um, these are some of the authors that you might want to be familiar with. Chris does a lot of um, horror and suspense. Alea Don Johnson is going to appeal to your older readers. She's uh, speculative fiction, um, a lot of um, uh, LGBT issues in her books. Greg Neary's do fantastic YA, but he's gone middle school on us. The mm -hmm. first Sherry Smith book I wrote was set in Alaska with a girl in a fishing boat. She's an African-American author, and her stuff is really good. Stephanie Keene does some of the most suspenseful stuff you're going to read. She is wonderful. Aisha Saeed is very new. Candy Gourley is Filipino, very new. Her stuff's been out a couple years but she's really good. Fonda Lee is going to do sci-fi for you. 
Hiromi Gato is um, Japanese American who does um, graphic novels, really good graphic novels. Kristen Simmons is also going to be Asian American sci fi. Naima Robert is going to give you um, Southeast, South, she's going to give you Muslim young adult fiction. Robbie Robertson is a famous songwriter, but he's Native American. S.D. Nelson, Native American. I know you've heard of Margarita Angle. Make sure you have her books on your shelf because she is wonderful. I'm sure you have, um, who is it wants to kick your, wants to kick your ass? What was her name? What was her name? Mm -hmm. Yaki Delgado wants to kick your ass. Excellent. <laughs> and, and it's funny because as, as out front and bold as that title is, I thought it was a rather calm, ordinary book. It, some people thought it was really dark and, and coarse and hard. I didn't think it was. I thought it was a very good, honest book. Um, Burn Baby Burn is wonderful. It's set back maybe in the 70s, the summer of Sam. It's a really good book. Mm -hmm. Zorada Korov, Korova is, um, she has a book about mermaids from um, Latino culture. Francisco Stork has been around a while. Rigoberto Gonzalez is um, gay Latinx. And they're, they're just, notice how many women are on here. Mm -hmm. Very few male authors. Um, they exist, but they're they're very hard to find. But these are some that I really wanted to highlight for you that you may or may not have heard of, whose books I would definitely recommend you have on your shelves. Sino Color, um, we do have a lot a lot of biracial children who cannot find themselves in books. Sino Color is a biracial African American white girl. I believe she's in her senior year of high school. She is a phenomenal baseball player. Her goal in life is to join. Um, the profession to be a professional baseball player mm -hmm. but in this book she's trying to understand her own identity if you don't have jenny han in your libraries please get jenny han she's she's wonderful um of course i like romance but <laughs> yeah she's good she's really good um more happy than not adam silvero is um lgbt um he is um i believe puerto rican Openly Straight, um, Bill Conisberg. I would imagine many of you have this or have read it. Um, and I believe a, he, um, this is about a young boy who is in a very open community and he's, he's tired of being the gay kid who's recognized for being gay and all the attention he gets for that and all the acceptance he gets for that. So he goes away to school and he doesn't want anybody to know that he is gay. He's just a guy. He's just an ordinary guy. And you can kind of imagine how that's going to work for him. Um, when the World Was Ours is another, um, she is Latinx um, lesbian writer. And I believe this is like a fantasy fairy tale. I have not had a chance to read that. I read her previous book. The Weight of Feathers, she is a phenomenal writer. She writes lyrical, beautiful, beautiful prose. Two Boys Kissing, David Levithan, is kind of a history of, um, of um, kind of a queer history in, in the United States and what it took to get to this point where these two boys could kiss in public. And it's, it's a beautiful book. Uh, Time to Dance is... Um, Indian American, um, she has a disability, a physical disability, but she wants to dance. Vivek Shreya's God Loves Hair is several years old, but it is a beautiful book. He's a gay male author, and this combines his gayness and his religion and his culture, and it is beautiful. Born Confused is a young girl um, learning about her Indian heritage. Very good book. And I see we're running out of time. So I'm going to just, um, these are the books that I want to read next, if I have time, mm. when I'm finished with my duties here. But I'm going to stop and get your questions, because we just have, I, I really am sorry I went so long. That's okay. The great information. And these will all be in the PowerPoint, which okay. we'll send, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. I love the title of It Ain't So Awful, Full Awful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's middle school, but I hear really good things about that book, so I want to read that. <laughs> So uh, does anybody have any questions out there? We did have a comment earlier. Robbie says her teen book uh, club read Under a Painted Sky, and they really enjoyed it. 
And How It Went Down is one of her favorite books to recommend. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, I don't see any other questions or anyone typing. Um, oh, now we have Maria typing. Is there anything else you wanted to say about any of the books you didn't get to? Or um, I can tell you that Kathleen Birkensaw is a Japanese-American writer, and I hope to have an interview with her on my blog in the next couple of weeks. Oh, cool. Her mother was a survivor of Hiroshima. And this is a retelling of her mother's story. The Head of the Saint is a Brazilian story that was translated and published here. Cool. Do we have any? Um, it looks like mostly people saying thanks. And uh, Marie says, awesome books. Um, you guys, I'm going to, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to pull up your LEU 